well. Well, I don't know if I can follow up with uh, Deb's presentation too well. I'm sure it might be a whole lot more than mine. So, I can't believe she's retired. I'm only 45 years old, retired already? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, my presentation is on uh, basically a kind of aeration design considerations. I'm going to talk about aeration and drain pans. Uh, so I'm going to kind of go through some of the, some different functions and different things about aeration and drain pans. Uh, this is a definition I found one time I was kind of doing some searching, and I just like this definition it's from the University of Minnesota about why you need aeration, and I thought it was just pretty concise, and, you know, about the definition about absorbability and moisture and that kind of stuff on there. I've always liked showing that. Uh, but basically, why do you have aeration in a drain bin? You know, you gotta, it prevents maintenance of the drain. It's, it's a, a lot of money in the drain bin. It prevents the spoilage, maintains the condition of the drain, you know, controls the moisture and insect activity. Uh, here's a chart that I've seen, and it kind of tells you if you have high temperature corn, high moisture, your, your length of it does not last. So that's why you have aeration on drain bins. So this is kind of a chart showing maximum allowable storage time on certain temperatures. And you can see you cool your grain down to 30 degrees, and it's 18% moisture before the discharge, which should last about 648 days. And that's what I want to make the point of. This aeration is not so much about drawing your grain, it's more about maintaining the condition of the grain. So typically in the fall in this area, you, you cool your grain down and maintain it for long-term storage. Uh, in cooling a grain, the rule of thumb and so is you take, typically take like yeah, 110 CFM bushel on air on your, on your grain, whether it doesn't matter if it's 110 on corn or 110 on wheat. You take that denominator 10, multiply it by 15, that kind of gives you a rule of thumb of how long it's going to take to get that aeration from, or the cooling from through the grain. So if you have 110 CFM on corn, multiply 10, it's going to take you 150 hours to get the aeration through that grain. Get that cooling from the grain. Uh, some people, that number, some people say it's 12, some people say it's 15, but I use 15 as a little more on the conservative side. Um, and it's best done in about 10 degree increments. You don't want to just try to pull all the way down at one time. And the reason why you have condensation. When you start getting about 15 degree difference in temperature, you get condensation, you start getting condensation, you get moisture in there, so you want to make sure you don't get moisture levels in there in the rain which can cause problems, you can get crusty and that kind of stuff. Um, and also, this aeration will reduce the moisture, you know, typically, if you got, um, get a point or two out of the grain. Uh, one thing I definitely want to mention is pouring the bin for a lot of better aeration in the grain. Typically, when you fill a bin, and this is kind of a maintenance issue too, is you're going to have your peak, unless you have a spreader, you'll have your peak. And if you don't pour that down, what happens, all your fines, all your foreign materials in the center of that tank, and all your air can go from the outside edge of that tank. So by pouring that grain, what you do is you reduce the resistance in the center of the tank, allow the air more uniform to go that grain. So it's a very important thing. Uh, some people have spreaders and they work real well, um, but if you don't have a spreader that sit and spreads it all even, especially foreign material out, you need to make sure you pour that grain. And temperature tables, I definitely recommend having temperature tables on your grain bins. Uh, once again, they kind of give you an idea. If you got a good temperature cable system, if you start getting hot spots, you know when you need to start running your, your aeration. It helps you know, tell you about the condition of your grains. I do recommend temperature cables. Uh, here's just a kind of a guide that you can use for kind of gives you an idea. When you're looking for like designing a drain bin, whether it's new, retrofits, whatever, if you have an idea of the moisture of the corn you're going to be using, the moisture of the grain, you kind of have an idea of what the aeration you need to do for maintaining the grain. Uh, obviously, the more higher the moisture content, the more air you want to get on it, kind of cool down faster and stuff like that. So there's some, some guidelines we have. Uh, also, let's talk about fans real quick. There's basically, in the industry, there's essentially three kinds of fans. You get your active fans, typically used for smaller bins. You hook up a low speed, high speed, inline specific ones. You also have roof exhaust, which I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these. Axial, uh, axial fans are a lot of air, a lot of air goes through an axial fan. Good for about maybe six inches of static pressure typically. Smaller bins, ground piles, they don't have a lot of static pressure, they can't get through a great big bin. Uh, but they're noisy. 
you got like about 35 an hour people ordering those, those screeners. So that's, that can be an issue, especially as you, uh, as elevators are an old area and you need to, uh, as the town grows around it, or uh, if you've got noise considerations, something to keep in mind. Also, you have those cases, of those which is medium static pressure, about maybe 12 inches. They're good for most of the steel cell bins. And, uh, they are quieter than your uh, action bins. So that's an option if you've got noise instead of using action fans, you probably use those to be chilled. And then you have your high speed fans, 3,500 RPM. Uh, high static pressure, you go up about 20 inches of static pressure. They're good for like your, your taller concrete bins, uh, extremely large bins, and also like uh, you've got small grains, like your wheat, your mills, that kind of stuff. But once again, they're also going to be noisy because you got once you get that water run around 3,500 RPM. Uh, inline receptacles, they're usually once again about medium pressure. About 10 inches of static pressure. They're similar designed to an axle fan, but they're actually a centrifugal, uh, but they're also kind of loud, but they're uh, quieter than an axle fan. And then roof exhausters, uh, basically, that's an important part in my mind of any good drain system is have some kind of good roof exhaustion. And you got paper style, which I think Deb has someone who shows the pictures on her presentation. And also, you got some other ones like concrete ones that have like a vertical, which is like an axle fan, you know, on top of the drain. Uh, types, as you look at irrigation systems, there's, there's, there's a variety of types out there. I'm going to go to talk about these real quick. But you, know, you got your push, pull, tandem, roof pull, roof, uh, push pulls, and there are other systems like air augers and manifolds. Uh, push, this is a system most of the irrigation uh, market probably recommends is a push system. You push the air in there, it's warm air right, so actually you're pushing the, the cool air in. Hopefully, that warm air also helps uh, more more uniform air distribution. And but roof exhausters, I, roof exhausters are really needed on this system because when you sign the roof exhaust about 150 percent, as it moisture comes out, you have all the moisture inside that dumpy spot on top of the drain mat. You want to make sure you change that out. When you sign the oversize, you get that air out, so you keep that moisture with condensation. Once again, if it's 15 degree difference, you need condensation. You want to make sure that it doesn't happen. Now, full system, once again, you're, this, you have the fan on the body pulling your air from the top down. Uh, one problem, you, get, you can get stuff on the floor, you can pour all stuff down into the fans, over the fans. Air distribution is not as uniform. Typically, in a system like this, and this used to be a really popular system, is the air goes right down the path of the system, so it's going to come right down. And sometimes, on each side of it, you might have air that gets We really don't need roof exhaust on it. Now TANM, a uh, fan series, some people call it like a turbocharged system. Uh, it's for like a high static pressure application. It has the same criteria basically as a push system. And if you're not familiar with it, that's what a TANM fan system looks like. You got two fans, one just pushing in the other fan, pushing the drain in. Uh, and you go on with like a push-pull system. A push-pull system is uh, you got a fan on the top, you got a fan on the bottom. Typically only concrete, it's not very common. But the system has to be sealed. It's, if you don't have it sealed, then the air is going to leak, and then basically you're going to lose your, uh, lose your efficiency of the fan. A rope pull, similar. You just had a fan group on top, you get your vents on the bottom, sometimes duct work on the bottom, pull the air up through there. Once again, it's not a common system, it's kind of weird. And also you have uh, like an air auger canal system. It's a push system, you have troughs in there. And bellows and unloading systems are kind of zero bit entry type solution in the market right now. Uh, manifolds. Manifold is ductwork you use with a uh, drain with the aeration system. It allows some guys use it to get the aerate multiple bins with one fan so you run ductwork with a series of valves. Uh, but when you aerate a bin, effectively you can only aerate one bin at a time. And the reason why is air will take half of each existence, so you have two bins. One fan falling into both of them, one's half full, one's all the way full, all your air is going to go to the half full. So you get the aeration there, you're not going to get the aeration on the other thing. And then ducting, you need to make sure your ducting is probably sized properly. And that's, you know, if you've got kind of mics here or anything, you've got the, what Mark from uh, Boom. If you want to get some size and stuff done like that, contact the uh, aeration manufacturer. What else you that? And also in this one, since you have all the, you know, the bins on it, it's harder to control. If you have the temperature tables are telling you some grains get hot in both bins, well, you can't aerate both bins at the same time, so you kind of have to make a choice sometimes. Uh, 
Uh, and this is just a picture of how some animals and ducks would look. Um, now, like I said, I want to talk about like, design considerations on grain bins. And when you talk to the aeration manufacturer, whoever's doing the design, you know what type of grain it is. You can have multiple grains, you can have single grain, but that's going to affect what kind of static pressure. Um, I put static pressure on the collection, but also moisture, because once again, from the earlier slide, if you have higher moisture grain, or you put 15% moisture grain, if you only need one ten CFM, you've got higher moisture grain, you want to use a little high flow of more air, so maybe like a little one seven CFM or so. Exhausters and vents, you want like like I mentioned this earlier, you want to size your fans to about 100 for 150 percent of the design CFM and fans. Uh, you want to actually have more than adequate gravity vents. And on this, you want, as I mentioned last one, this is real important also. You want to place your exhausters at the peak, the highest up you can get on the peak of the vent toward the toward the peak of the roof. You want to put your fence around the outside edge so that way you end up with the sweeping action so you can keep some moisture off the bottom of the roof sheets. I kind of thought, and I know this is kind of dry, so I don't have any fun video like right this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a tunnel of ductwork design, one thing uh, I want to mention we got cross sectional washings, that's basically the speed of the air going through the duct. People that design understand you, you want to keep you know, 4,000 CFM or below. Sometimes the low speed thing is you always keep like 3,500 or below. But you want to keep, if it gets too fast, you're not going to get adequate ventilation. So you want to keep it below. Surface velocities, once again, surface velocities are the, the velocity of the air coming through the, uh, the perforation point. So they keep, you want to keep it below 50, 50 feet per minute. And the perforated point, this is what we want. I said keep it within 75% of the radius. Air will take past these resistance. And I want to make, mention this here. When you have a flush floor, this is mostly the flush floor systems. You typically want to keep all your perforated floor within that 75% diameter of that bin and keep the other, because it helps with the air flow, keeps the air, makes the air have to work to go to the outside walls. So it actually helps with the aeration system, keeping better, more uniform air flow inside. And this is something I want to throw together. It's a lot of people don't understand, or it's kind of hard to understand. But what I did is I looked, you know, using some aeration programming, and I put 110 CFM for bushel four, 110 CFM for bushel three. This is on a 90 foot diameter tank, and this is like the minimum horsepower so you can have a fan action methods. Just want to kind of make people understand as you get taller these tanks, you get taller, how much more horsepower it takes, how much more that pressure it takes. If you look at the at 50 foot of grain bed, you 16 horsepower will take care of 110 CFM or and that's great. But if you get to 100 feet, now you need 123 horsepower, 124 horsepower. That's about 70 times higher. It's not a linear growth, it's an it's a exponential growth curve, and then you have to watch out for it. And the same thing, you know, and the same thing with wheat. You see there, 50 feet, you need 52 you know, horsepower, and you can also see the static pressure also is not linear. The only thing linear here is on the foot, so you got to. Keep that in mind as you get these taller and bigger grain bins. Aeration, hard to maintain the quality of the grain. The grain's never going to be any better than it is in the first gen. If you don't maintain it, but you're going to have to sometimes get some horsepower. Like I said, you've got, you're going to be storing wheat. And this is another example of this. If you have a bin using it for multiple commodities, let's say you've got a bin you've been using it for wheat in the spring and then you use it for in the fall, you want to make sure your aeration system is sized properly. So in this case, you're going to have to have fans, you know, doing 360, 370 horsepower and 100 foot, 100 foot each. So you got to kind of keep on what you're doing. Where you size it for corn, you put wheat in there. You can see right now you got 120 horsepower. Well, in that case, basically, if you want to utilize those fans, then essentially you're going to have to maybe go a little deeper than maybe 70 feet, which is real hard to maintain. So when you look at the design of aeration, make sure you pay attention to what commodities you're going to use. Because that will affect your horsepower and in turn affects your CFM coming up blue and your uh, exhausters. Um, and I just want to throw a couple uh, examples of different kind of flooring systems. People got their own preferences. No one's really any better than the other one. Um, just kind of count names. This is kind of a standard parallel system. This is like a large like 105 foot tank that had six, six fans out. That's like a parallel. Sometimes people call that seat to the outside end, they'll put a little pop sheet on that. Uh, here's a double H. 
and then here's something to be like a quad F. And these are all quite common. You guys have probably seen these, so I just want to throw them in there real quick. Uh, flush floor options, when you start looking at drain vents, you got corrugated flooring, you got plank floor sections you can use in your tunnels. It also has dry over where you do bar grading and like support beams to hold that bar grading over. So that's better if you got a bobcat going in your van and you're cleaning it out. So those are some things to pay attention to. A lot of options out there as far as plumbing too. Uh, and also you have building and temp store. You know, once again, you have plastic pipes, steel pipes, you get all through the driveway systems on these also. Um, also mention something. Here's another aeration system out there. It's, some people use it, some people love it. I would call it an air or canal system. Um, it's it's more costly than canner system, but you don't have a sleep in there. But there's some some kind of criteria here. It's like it says you know you can clean the vent out more than four or five times a year, like you got a port facility or a rail facility, you're changing and drain out quite quite frequently. They could probably pay for it so they're not using the sleep. All your moving parts are outside, so it's like a zero open entry kind of solution. And you do have different configurations depending on your application. So that's just something to consider when you look at iteration systems for things. But it is a more costly system than your standard flush floor system. Uh, you got like center discharge, which you typically use like a steel bin. Side discharge, a lot of concrete tanks you use these. And you have, uh, and here's a picture of one, and just a interior picture of one where how one looks. You got concrete graders and the grade flow to those graders. And when, when you aerate, all those, all those troughs are aired at the same time. You don't know if you bring the air down in one trough, it's like an air bed and the drain the discharge point which is uh, retrofit. I just want to mention so retrofit system. The first thing I say, be careful. I mean, you never know you're gonna get uh, you got bins that are you know you have rested, you don't know what the floors are like, you don't know what the tunnels are like. So what is existing? You want to make sure that you look at it. What are the existing tunnels? What are the widths? What are the depths of the tunnels? You know, how many fans are already on it? Are you just updating a new system with new fans? Are you taking a system and go from one tenth CFF to one seventh CFF? Keep those in mind. So you've got to make sure your everything's adequate, even electrical concerns. You go from 40 horsepower to 50 horsepower, you have to change electrical issues. So keep an eye on that. One thing, when you start looking at the sizing of that, one thing if a customer calls me or, or any of these other aeration companies that are out there, they can pretty much tell you what size tunnels you'll need to keep the proper cross sectional velocities and proper surface velocities. So just because you want to retrofit a system, sometimes it's not the issue of just throwing another fan on there, putting a bigger fan on there. Because a bigger fan may actually hurt the system as opposed to helping the system. You get a bigger fan on there, you might have so much static pressure, so much cross sectional velocity that you're not getting a good operating system. So Contact every use for aeration. Contact the people you work with. I mean, I work for an aeration company. Love to help you, but I'm not the only expert out there. There's a lot of experts out there that can help you out. So. Any any questions? Yes, sir. We were talking about the horsepower of the fan to a push on that main. No, that was total force fighting. Yeah, that's total, it's assuming you had like a, let's say you had four runs, you had 60 horsepower, then you have like four, four horsepower fan. That's the total horsepower you would have needed for that particular thing. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't have a speaking noise. Yes, ma'am. And then after you design the aeration, you would let them know if you're retrofitting the system. How many vents they have versus how many they do have? Yes, it's always, yeah. This, a lot of times, yeah, and that raises a good point. Uh, I do get calls to uh, look at an existing system. A lot of people, the ones I get most, most of the time where they have a full system they want to change to a push system, a lot of times they don't have any the vents, they don't have any roof exhausters. So whenever you change a system, make sure who you're ever talking to, what system it is, and let them know if you have roof exhaustion, if you don't have roof exhaustion, if you have existing vein, or you don't have any existing vein, because that'll make a big difference on what's going on. So as much information you can give whoever's working with them, your agent system, give to them. It's a big help. And that way they can adequately do it. That way it's, it's, it keeps the surprises down there. Around.
we have an overhead bed that no bed on it, just uh, bed size. What, how many beds? Uh, how many of you have on this bottom? On, on the beds, if you, if you got to say, if you got a hopper tank, you're talking about a full hopper tank or something, uh, you need enough beds to basically handle whatever the loading or unloading rate is. Uh, the aeration, our typical rule of thumb is for every thousand CFM, you use one square foot of bedding. Um, and also with hopper tank, we still recommend putting bedding where you can put the corrugated pipe goes down inside those tanks to aerate them also, especially if you want to hold bedding for a period of time. So that's to answer your question. It comes down to really the size of how fast are you putting grain into it, how quick are you discharging the grain. You want to make sure you have enough bedding to take care of those issues. So. Do you know what opening size we have on the Twelve. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You, you equate that to how many square foot and then from there you can determine how much bed you need. So you use a little thumb gravity bed, so like for every thousand, so speak, four thousand CFM of air discharging out of that bin or in, in grain, trying to heat that bin, you have enough aggregate bed to take care of that. And it never hurts to have more bed. Uh, if you uh, even if you don't have uh, any aeration on the bin, it doesn't hurt to put bins around because it helps exchange the air out on the top of the bin. And if you don't, um, several years ago I was dealing with this one gentleman, his idea of venting was is you put bins like at the lower edge or the middle of the top because it would help because you get like a natural action. You get the heat hitting the roof seats, so heat rises, so it actually helps keep the bin and clear out and out of the south. Not that I recommend it, but that's what his recommendation was. So, yeah, I've been in the ratio several years ago. So, yeah. Then he never heard.